Hi guys, thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Danielle McMunn and I'm here to talk about some pretty deep stuff. I want to share with you all about my younger years and my diagnosis of bipolar. I'm going to share with you all my psych ward admissions over the years. I'm going to explain to you how I fought my mental disorder to the bitter end and how I almost killed myself and others. I really hope that by me being brave and working on the shame in my closet that I can help others. All right, what is bipolar? Let's get right into that. Um, I have bipolar one disorder. There is also bipolar two and something called cyclothmic disorder. Um, so what I'm familiar with is bipolar one and what is bipolar? Bipolar disorder is a type of mood disorder. Bipolar disorder used to be called manic depression. It was called manic depression because people with bipolar disorder go through periods of intense depression and other periods where their mood is extremely high. These high periods are known as mania. It's important to note that most people with bipolar disorder have periods where their moods are normal. Normal is good. Um, bipolar 1 disorder is when you experience at least one manic episode or mixed episode. See, blah, blah, blah. Most people who have bipolar 1 disorder also experience episodes of depression. Manic episodes last for at least one week and depressive episodes for at least two weeks, but both may continue for many months. Bipolar 1 disorder is the most severe form of the illness. Bipolar 2 is when you have mostly episodes of depression plus occasional episodes of hypomania. Hypomania is a milder and shorter form of mania that usually lasts just a few days, but it can still impair your functioning. Between episodes, there are usually periods of wellness. The risk of suicide is high for this type of bipolar disorder. It can be hard to tell the difference between hypomania and a good mood. So bipolar 2 is also often not recognized as easily as bipolar 1. Who does it affect? More than 2% of the population will have bipolar disorder at some point in their lives. Um, what can you do about it? Uh, medication, counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, support groups, self-help. Um, I just want you to know that I'm going to share what's my path and what's helped for me. Um, I'm always open and here to help anyone that's going through troubles, um, but... I'm not a professional and this is just my experience. All right. Um, this story is something I have been working very hard to not feel ashamed of. The more I learn and grow, the more I accept my past and am almost regret free. I have learned to find the meaning of my suffering and in turn use my personal tragedies into personal triumphs. Self-actualization is my ultimate goal. I will share some pictures and hopefully strike some curiosity if you haven't seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Self-actualization is the realization of fulfillment of one's talents and potentialities especially considered as drive or need present in everyone. Self-actualized people accept themselves and others as they are. They tend to lack inhibition and are able to enjoy themselves and their lives free of guilt. Not only do self-actualized people fully accept themselves, they also embrace other people for who they are. According to the hierarchy of needs, 
self-actualization represents the highest order motivations which drives us to realize our true potential and achieve our ideal self. Hopefully I haven't lost you already. On to me. I was born in October 1986 on Thanksgiving at the MSA Hospital in Abbotsford, BC. My mom went into labor after dinner at least and always joked that she never got her pumpkin pie. I was somewhat an average child with high energy, and I mean really high energy. My parents knew I was special when I started to walk and climb ladders at 18 months. Climb ladders onto the roof type climb ladders. I did not have a lot of fear and had some compulsion issues. Skiing as a child, I would be the one flying down the mountain over my head and a little out of control only to hit a jump and go flying while my goggles fell down over my eyes and, well, I had to land somehow. Quickly being scorned to stay behind my dad as a rule. I was a home run slugger, a tackle football with the boys in the field in Yarrow, soccer fanatic kind of girl. No fear, Adidas and Nike were all I would approve of. I was our mom's firstborn girl, and dresses were an argument. Shopping was dreading. I was controlled and well participated in school. No issues ever there. My parents were very shocked and surprised. It was my behavior when I came home from it all, and it came unwound. Of course, home sweet home. We had a perfect couple acres with animals and tree houses, swings, and the best trampoline ever. We had so many trees to climb and space to play sports. It was a rad property to grow up on. At some point, my mom took me to the child psychologist in about grade four or five. I remember clearly wondering what I was doing there. It was pretty confusing. My behavior was a big contribution to my parents' not-so-smooth sailing in their relationship. Since my husband and I have gone through the same issues with our son, I can speak from experience. Anyways, they prescribed me with Dexagen, Dexedrin, and I was not happy taking pills or how they made me feel. So that was scrapped. Kindergarten through grade 10, were some of the best years of my life. I had the best, most coolest friends, went to the awesomest schools, Yarrow, Vetter, and Sardis with all my friends. I was lucky we never moved. I played on many co-ed softball and soccer teams along with my siblings. We were a very busy sports family. Growing up at the lacrosse rink, watching our brother, my sister and I soon became very involved in soccer. I do not know how our parents did all the driving around the lower mainland and from Yarrow to Sardis to Chilliwack for work every day and then later on that day for sports. Our parents are truly the heroes. My sports families were like family and what a fun decade we had. Come grade 11, Heavy drinking, hormones, and bad decisions, along with freedom, come into full effect. That's where things really turned for me. The loss of a friend in a car accident at Cultus Lake really shook me up. I didn't know how to process it, and as we did then, we rallied as a group of very saddened friends and drank and smoked weed in mourning of the tragic accident. I was quickly losing sleep and starting to spiral. I went from hypomanic to full-blown manic and then into a serious psychosis. My family was very concerned and worried for me. My mom worked for Stalo Health at the time and got her friend co- slash co-worker who was a mental health worker to do a wellness check on me. By then I was delusional and completely out of my right mind. I soon entered psychosis. I was rapidly talking and had grandiose thinking, was making outrageous plans. Then they drove me to the psych ward at Chilliwack Hospital, where my very painful journey begins. 
Admitted for the first time, I was very ill. I barely remember. I was mourning the loss of a young person, confused and delirious. I was not okay or safe to be anywhere but there. After a couple weeks locked up, it was horrible and I wanted out, but had to get somewhat balanced before they would let me out. I honestly was so manic, I thought I was really special. We or I had not heard of bipolar before, but polar bears were my favorite bear in the entire world. <laughs> I had a stuffy as a child and I was very attached. I thought bipolar, hmm, a special power where I get to feel and see things differently. At first, mania felt good. It was a high you can't explain. After two weeks under assessment, the psychiatrist diagnosed me bipolar. I was 15 then and never heard of such a thing. Does this mean I'm different than my peers? And it seemed so with the crazy attention and very serious meetings and doctors I was dealing with. I was too immature and then underinformed on the illness. We did not have smartphones or access to Google like we do now. That was a long time ago. Just like my personality, I kept on trying to live my normal teenage life, not letting a weird diagnosis bother me. Following the next three years, at age 15, 16, and 17, I celebrated each Christmas holiday in the psych ward in Chilliwack General Hospital. As I grew older, I didn't have a faith to compartmentalize the happenings in my life. I was growing more and more insecure with my mental state and finding myself in mania at every trigger that popped up. For me and a lot of people with mental issue, stress is a major trigger. I was a victim of rape on two occasions and both found myself more and more unwell and admitted into the hospital. Christmas was again a very confusing time for me with my mania. I was deeply connected to a higher power whom all I knew from my childhood was Jesus. I was searching for answers and so lost in space, sleep was not natural. My mind went a million miles per hour and what made perfect sense to me at the time was out to lunch to others. I would stay up for a couple days and usually drugs and alcohol were involved in the good feeling of going manic heart pumping, becoming delusional, and connecting with cats and bugs. <laughs> I felt like I was invincible, one of God's children, and I was on some path that kept bringing me back to the Chilliwack Hospital that soon became my regular second home. I soon knew the nurses and psychiatrists, all the doctors at the hospital. I feel so sad to look back and realize I was living in a major mental bubble for a number, number of years. I fought so hard for my right to be a normal teenager. In the hospital, they were only trying to help, but I could not and would not understand what bipolar was. They told me my first admittance that I would never be able to drink or smoke weed again. They say... They said that I would be on medication and close monitoring for the rest of my life. Well, that didn't sit well with me, but I soon learned the game. Take the pills, follow the rules, participate, act like you're well. I was a bad actor and they couldn't keep me forever. Most admissions were for two weeks. I invited all my friends to come visit. We played ping pong and colored. We laughed and made jokes. My friends never made me feel crazy or treated me any differently. I made lots of friends in there as well, and some still to this day. In and out of high school, I was admitted, and I'm proud to say that no one, I mean no one, at my high school made fun of me. I graduated grade 12 proudly with my peers, and went to convocation and prom. Next comes working life and more psychosis. Weed psychosis had me admitted. 
Any stress and drinking had me admitted. I did not learn. I could not wrap my head around this mental condition. I played on a couple different soccer teams. I worked a full-time job and lived a semi-normal life. I would not let this bizarre mental thingy affect me, okay? I did try to take medications and stay stable, but the side effects killed me. I can say now I tried them all, but then they would knock me out and I couldn't wake up. I felt like a legit zombie. Not fun. I even more was mad at the world and the psych drugs for ruining my life. These really were shaping up to be the most volatile worst years of my life. At 18, I was feeling like my life had become a game. Cat and mouse game. The police knew me and my truck. I would be pulled over just for wellness checks and to make sure I was on my meds. Life sucked. I felt very weird and uncomfortable in my skin. After one of many arrests under the Mental Health Act for being mentally ill, I was, ad- I was admitted, and this time looked a little different than the rest. Along with myself, my friends were annoyed and confused why and how they could keep locking me up. So my best friend came into the hospital this last admittance, and we had a plan to break me out. I had my stuff ready and she was coming in and we were going to simply walk out and leave. She had the getaway car ready. Well, this didn't go to plan and they took it very seriously, thank God in hindsight. Chilliwack sent me by ambulance to the highest security asylum in BC. Off I go to Riverview Hospital. Yes, the big, creepy, old, ancient, decrepit, iconic building was by far the scariest time of my life, not knowing what the hell I was doing here. And I was in an adult max security facility with a whole crew of seriously mental adults. Many stories there, but I will share that in an exclusive Riverview video. It wasn't fun, and uh, thinking about it gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um... In and out of hospital had me on blister packs of medications, and believe me, I wasn't able to think clearly, in hindsight, should have never been able to drive. I fell asleep driving and crashed. I once thought I was connected with a higher power in major mania and drove through five red lights at full speed, testing God's will, without getting hit or hitting anyone to show up at my destination without the police chasing me. I was beyond ill, and I could have easily killed someone or myself. That test I did was the proof I needed to share with my mom that I was truly extraterrestrial. Mom, you gave birth to an angel. I'm so close to God, I'm untouchable. Well, that phone call to my mom sure blew up in my face. I was high on life and finally found my truth. I was so happy for once and excited to tell my boyfriend the good news after I hung up with my mom. Little to my knowledge, my mother was at a support group for parents with children with mental disorders, and my personal psychiatrist was hosting that group that night. Small world. Well, he called into the police and had me arrested under the Mental Health Act. It was not a pretty sight. It took three police in my fit of rage and confusion to get me contained and pinned on a board and all strapped up. My dad had been informed I'd be involuntarily arrested and taken into hospital, so he was there and seen the horrific incident go down. With so much shame, I share that I spat in the officer's face at every attempt to be freed. Not my finest moments. I was so angry and now being admitted to what felt like jail when I had just figured everything out for myself. Well, that was the last Christmas I spent there in the Chilliwack site ward. I was booked for a month in Costa Rica with some friends and that was just a few weeks away. I had to get out of the hospital and prove I'm okay. Coming to after getting tranquilized, getting out of the padded room of confinement a day or so later, 
I was still really ill. When they tranquilized me on the hospital bed, all strapped down, I had an allergic reaction to the shot and my tongue swelled up. So they had to give me another shot to counteract that drug. What a mess. Then I had to deal with the aftermath and try to get myself better to get on a plane and hit up Costa Rica with my friends. Minor roadblock. <laughs> it wasn't the first. I'd been locked up in the hospital so many times. But I still had a life and I was not willing to give bipolar any power. We had this trip booked for over a year. I was pleasantly surprised to hear that the police were not going to charge me for spitting in their face, so that wouldn't affect my trip. My family was not in support of me going. And then came the ultimatum from my boyfriend. You go to Costa Rica and we're done. Well, I sucked up my pride and made the best decision of my life not to go. Lame. It was not an easy choice, and I was very, very, very upset. At a number of points in my spiral that I believe was so much more elevated from the drinking and marijuana use, I fell short of a place to live. I had burned all my bridges and could not or would not get stable. I felt I was being robbed of my teenage years, dealing with all these jail-like experiences of being locked up and involuntarily admitted. I was scared and certain there was nothing wrong with me. I was sure I was a rock star, just like everyone else in the party crew that I was hanging out with. I honestly didn't even know what bipolar was. We did not have smartphones then, and I was known for having a pager at one point because I lost so many cell phones and racked up huge bills. I had a very volatile life and was not making good decisions. I was fighting at bars and hanging with like-minded people to me at the time. I will include I was very underage and had a fake ID from grade 9 or 10. I yearned to be cool and grown up. I smoked cigarettes and partied every weekend. My soccer team and friends I grew up with watched me slowly drift off into a different life. These decisions got me nowhere. With a serious mood disorder I didn't take seriously, I paid the piper. There was no peace or harmony left inside me. I lost myself, and when I submissed after all the years of mental and physical abuse to my brain and body, I hit my all-time low. Arrested under the Mental Health Act so many times, I got paranoid and thought people were following me. Once, I flushed my rings down the toilet in a dump motel, talking to God, wanting a sign. Calling my parents to bail me out of all these situations, you can only imagine who the heroes were. I am proud of their decisions. They made now, but then I was in a world of hurt and feeling disowned. Disowned by my parents and my family for not taking me in and letting me live the life I wanted to live. I'm so saddened to say that these inner feelings and harborings that I had towards my family carried on until my 30s. That's a long time to carry hurt. Um, Coming up here, I'm going to pop back on and uh, discuss hey guys, a couple more I things with thank you. Thank you so much for um, listening this far. I hope it hasn't been too much. Um, I have decided to do this in two parts because it's just too long and a break is needed. Um, I'm going to get into the major depression and um, the lows and working through the traumas and kind of the 20s and 30s in my next segment that's coming up right after. I want to thank you for listening and yeah, this is part of the journey and I just want to spread awareness and get all this crap out of me and inside so I can move on and also inspire other people to not be ashamed of their past. 
I love you and thank you very much.